All right, let's take our Bibles, please, and uh, we're going to open the First Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1, what I'd like you to do is to put your finger in that spot, but also turn to Acts chapter 17. So have both of those spots. If you have your tablet, then just be quick with your fingers, I suppose. Father, thank you so much. We are blessed by your word, and we open our Bibles, we open our hearts, we want to receive. Pour out your spirit, pour out your life, minister to us through your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so Paul is writing, um, this is not a letter that he wrote from prison at all, uh, and uh, he is writing to the church that he started in the city of Thessalonica, and uh, it is a, a city today, if you go to the Mediterranean, and if you ever go on a tour, have an opportunity to go through the footsteps of Paul, which we hope to do, love to do next year if we can do it, um, is you go there and it is really a beautiful port city right in the, the um, north of Greece, back in the old days, the south of uh, Macedonia, and it's a beautiful, beautiful town, maybe 200,000 at the time that Paul was there. Very significant city, major crossroads between the two Roman uh, roads. And uh, today, maybe a million people. Very beautiful, beautiful place. It wasn't always called Thessalonica. Uh, it used to be uh, named after the hot springs that was there, Therma. And uh, people would, of course, what a beautiful place vacation spot, you know, right by the, the Mediterranean, the hot springs. People would love to go there. It was beautiful. It was a center of commerce, thriving city in many ways, beautiful. It was later named after the uh, half-sister of Alexander the Great, and um, <clears throat> basically it, the name means the victory of Thessalonia, and uh, that was her name, interestingly enough, obviously named after some great battle. <clears throat> but Paul went there, uh, if you remember, he was over in kind of the Asia Minor area, we call it Turkey today, and uh, he had this vision uh, that there was this man from Macedonia, which is the area just north of Greece, calling, uh, calling out to him in his dream, in his vision. So he believed that was an uh, indication of the spirit that he was to go there. And so they take a ship, they go over, they go up to Philippi. Remember that we read this when we studied the book of Philippians. Um, and he starts this church. If you remember, he ends up in great trouble uh, because he cast this demon out of this woman. And uh, the owners don't appreciate the fact that now she can't tell fortunes. And so he ends up in jail, falsely accused. He gets beaten with rods. It's terrible. You remember the story. And uh, about midnight, there's this great earthquake while he is singing hymns with, with Silas. And uh, the, the jailer, presuming that everyone's escaping, took his sword out to kill himself. Paul stops him. And uh, the, the jailer is just so taken by all of this that, like, how do I get saved? And so uh, the, the jailer takes Paul and Silas to um, his house in the middle of the night, cleans up their wounds, gives them a meal, and the whole house hears the gospel. And, uh, you know, they are, are part of the church, meaning believe that he became a leader in the church. And uh, so very, the next day, uh, Paul is encouraged by the city leaders, maybe it's time to move on from here. And so that's actually where he goes next. So I want to read the account of how this church in Thessal Thessalonica got started. So let's go to Acts 17, keeping your finger in 1 Thessalonians. And um, so it's the, here's the story, Acts 17. Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica after leaving Philippi. Uh, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So according to Paul's custom, he went to them, to the Jews, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. I would have loved to have been in that study as he went through the Old Testament. That's what it means. He went through the Old Testament, and he could demonstrate and prove that Jesus was the Messiah right out of the Old Testament. 
which is really a wonderful study. And whenever we go through the Old Testament, which we'll do, of course, when we finish Revelation, uh, that's one of the things we look for is that very thing that Paul did. And it's a beautiful, powerful study. So verse 3 says, He was explaining and giving evidence that the Christ or the Jewish Messiah, that's what Christ means, the Jewish Messiah, had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And he demonstrates this from the Old Testament, giving evidence and explaining it to them. And then he said to them, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Messiah. He is the Jewish Messiah. He is the Christ. Now, some of the Jews were persuaded by this. And they joined up in, with Paul and Silas. Then, it says, along with a great multitude of God-fearing Greeks. So, these are Greeks who have a, a heart to honor, to understand who is God. They have an honest, good heart to truly understand, and a great multitude, which is to say, a revival is breaking out now, and is only there a few weeks and it says, and there were a number of leading women also joined up with them. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob. Uh, seems like mobs just follow Paul. He just generates mob action everywhere he goes. But, you know, extraordinary things happen to extraordinary people. And Paul is an extraordinary person with the gospel just alive in his heart. And, and the Holy Spirit is just stirring up city after city after city and revival upon revival. This is an amazing man of God. And so it tells us they, they became jealous. They started forming a mob and they set the city in an uproar. And so coming upon the house of Jason who was aligned with them, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. And now, when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting out, These men who have upset the world have come here also. Now, that is a great accusation. That is a powerful statement. These men who have upset the world. Wouldn't that be just an amazing uh, declaration? You have upset the world, man. And now you've come here. And Jason, this fellow Jason, has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar. This is their, their, their wedge. Saying that there is another king, Jesus. So when they had stirred up the crowd and the cities, uh, city authorities who heard these things. So when they received a pledge or a bond, actually, from Jason and the others, they released them. Now, the brethren immediately set, sent Paul and Silas away by night to the next city, Berea. And so, um, Paul was a total of maybe three, four weeks in Thessalonica. That's the entirety of his visit there. He stayed in other places much longer. Three or four weeks is all he stayed in Thessalonica. And yet in just three or four weeks, a major revival breaks out and a major mob riot breaks out. He has just stirred up the city in just three short weeks. And so then he goes to Berea. So when the, they arrived in Berea, they went right into the synagogue of the Jews. He just doesn't know when to quit. And he's not going to quit. So he goes right to the synagogue of the Jews. Now, an interesting statement. These uh, in Berea were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. And he's sp uh, speaking of the Jews here. These Jews in uh, Berea were no more noble-minded than those who were in Thessalonica. Here's why it says. Because they received the word with great eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So Paul gave evidence. He quoted from the Old Testament. They went to their homes. They took out their uh, scrolls of the Old Testament, and they looked upon the scrolls. They verified the very things he was saying by checking on the scriptures. And by the way, uh, we have a phrase in, in Christianity 
we say, uh, of someone who does the very same thing, um, we say, ah, he's a good Berean. See, if somebody uh, listens to a message, for example, the pastor may give, and then says, I think I'm going to check that out myself. That's a really good thing. I think any pastor worth his salt is going to say, that's a great thing. You should do that. You are noble-minded if you check and verify the things that I say. And so that's what they did. They went, therefore, they're no, more noble-minded. Verse 12, many of them therefore believed, therefore, they believed, along with the number of the prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, well, then they came there following him. They came there likewise agitating and stirring up the crowds. And then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea. And then Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And receiving a command from Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So then of course we know that Paul goes to Athens. Uh, I'll give you one guess what breaks out there. And he goes to Athens, he starts debating with them in the square, and then, of course, a, a great agitation, but many come to faith in Christ. And from there, he goes to Corinth, and I'll give you one guess what breaks out there. He's there for a year and a half in Corinth, and a major city uh, revival happens. And it's just an amazing thing what is, what is happening here as you go through the, the book of Acts. Now, let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Because uh, this is, a, of course, a letter that he writes to this church that he founded there. And uh, many believe this is the very first letter that Paul ever wrote. So you might say this is the oldest of the Old Testament books that we have. This is like the oldest of the Old Testament books. So this was written probably about 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this is an amazing book that we have. And uh, he's, he's very concerned for them. Of course, he wants to know how they're doing. And so he sent Timothy, we'll get into this later, but he sends Timothy, his young assistant, his young helper, up to kind of give them further instruction, check on them, see how they're doing, bringing back word of the church. And so Timothy comes back encouraged. The church is doing really well. Only three, four weeks of Paul's uh, you know, visit, He's planted the church. He's got elders he pointed. Church is thriving. This is an amazing thing. And they're growing in the word of God. So Timothy brings back this report and uh, with questions because they're confused uh, about this issue of when Christ returns. And so one of the things that Paul explains in this book is about the return of Jesus Christ. We get some of our really wonderful last days Full, uh, prophecy and, 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 and doctrine out of these uh, chapters that we're going to study in First Thessalonians. So it's very exciting to understand what's happening. One of the things I think it's good for us to look at, though, here, you know, he's there about three, four weeks. He's got elders already, and the church is already, you know, doing well. And it's really an interesting thing because I, I think there would be a lot of people who would object uh, you know, if, if something like that was to happen today. They said, what, you, you were only there three, four weeks and you appointed elders? Uh, you know, these people aren't ready to be elders. But Paul was convinced these people were sincere, growing, and he started the church and launched off, you know. It reminds me of when we were, uh, when we were in Russia, and it was our very first trip to Russia, um, and uh, we had done all these different um, outreaches. Many had come to faith in Christ. It was a beautiful, we gave Bibles out. Man, it was just an absolutely glorious trip that we did. And before we left, we decided to do a baptism service in the Amur River, and, uh, which was really interesting because it was cold. And, and the day we got there, it was stormy. Uh, rainy. I mean, the wind was just blowing. The waves were just uh, stacked up in the river. And like, are you going to go through with this? And we said, yeah, we're going to go through with this. I mean, this is our, our opportunity to baptize these new believers. And, and uh, some of the folks from the Russian church came out to try to argue with us. 
And they said, we heard you're doing a baptism service here. And we said, yeah, we're going to baptize these new believers. Well, how long have they been believers? Well, some of them just a week, you know, others two weeks. And they said, we have jacked. These people aren't ready to be baptized. Well, if you know your Bible, you know that, that Philip baptized the Ethiopian eunuch within, like, what, minutes after he came to faith? So I thought we were on pretty good ground myself. I thought we were doing pretty well. And look, they've received Jesus Christ. They're excited to be baptized. We're going to do this thing. And so we had the authority of the Scripture to do it, and we had the waves to help us. And, uh, you know, when you're baptizing in, in the waves, it really is easy, you know, because, you know, when you're baptizing in water, you don't have to lower them down, you've got to raise them up, you know. But when you're baptizing in big waves, you just have to time it right. <laughs> you know, it's like, look over your shoulder. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Poosh! <laughs> like, yeah, that is, that is exhilarating there. The next. Anyway, it, was, it reminds me of that trip there. So he, he writes this letter now to explain these things and commend them to excel even more, to keep growing. And he wants them to, to, you know, to captivate on this joy and the growing of their faith to excel in it. Excel. I love because he's going to use that word multiple times in this book. Excel in it. And I think there's a great admonition to all of us. Excel in it. You, you're, you're in your faith. Are you in Jesus Christ? Excel in it. It's like, how important? You know, this is like eternity we're talking about here. Excel in it. You were talking about your soul. Excel in it. We're talking about the Word of God, which was given to, you know, strengthen our faith and to build our relationship to Christ. Excel in it. And he's going to keep saying this because it is really important. All right. With that as our background, we begin in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus, or Silas in other words, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Remember thou, they always started the letters with their names. We end ours with our names. They started with their name. Standard greeting of Paul, grace and peace to you. He loved that combination of things, grace and peace to you. We give thanks to God always for you, for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of God and Father. So those three things are really interesting because he's, he's capturing here three things that I think define spiritual maturity, and we should all really desire them as well. So he says, I, I have this in my mind when I'm praying for you, your work of faith. What does that mean, your work of faith? Well, uh, it is your faith, of course, that is put into life. Your work of faith. You're living your faith. It's real. It's sincere. You live it. It's part of you. Uh, someone came to Jesus at one time and said, what do we do to do the works of God? What do we do to do the works of God? And uh, I'm sure they were thinking of some you know, great list of spiritual things to do. And Jesus responded in a very simple thing. This is the work of God, that you would believe in he whom God has sent. That you believe. Faith. This is the work of God. This is what you do. You take your faith and you live out your faith. That is a beautiful picture. And that's maturity. All of us should have this real, sincere, genuine taking our faith and making it uh, an aspect of how we live. And he's going to get into this. He's going to, you might say, drill into the application of what that actually looks like in day-to-day -day life. So he's talking about, let it be real. Let it be part of how you live. Your faith should not be separated so that we have a spiritual life, and then we have a work life, and then we have a family life, and, you know, n n neither time shall they ever come together. No, they should all be according to faith. So that's what he's saying, work of faith. Then he says, and I also keep in mind your labor of love. That's a great phrase, your labor of love. In other words, they are, they are responding to the outpouring of God's love on them 
in such a way that they, they want to do works of love. They want to respond with love themselves. And, and it's a great difference between a labor of love and a burdensome thing. Um, what would be a good example? A good example would be Martha. Remember Martha and Mary. Jesus came to their house and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet and she's receiving the words of the Lord. And it is a, a beautiful thing that she's just sitting, listening, receiving. Martha is busy uh, preparing the meal. And so Martha is irritated and bothered that Mary's not helping her. And so she actually brings it up. She complains to the Lord. Do you not care? She's making it an accusation. Do you not care that my sister is not helping me? Helping me? Tell her to get up. Tell her to come and help me. Now, this is what you might call a bad attitude. And, and Jesus points it out to her. Martha, Martha. You're worried and bothered about so many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen the better part, and it will be not be taken from her. See, now, it would have been different, I think, if, if she would have done that as a labor of love. If she would have served, and if she would have said, you know what, that's beautiful, that, that Mary has this opportunity to sit at the feet of the Lord and to receive, that's beautiful. You go ahead, Mary, and I'll just, I'll just serve. I'll just prepare the meal. And then, you know, maybe later you can clean up the dishes and I'll sit and receive, you know. Maybe there was a better attitude that she could have had. And I think that's important because if, if you want to do something in the name of the Lord, it's important that you're doing it as a labor of love, that you're not doing it as a burden. That If it's a burden to you, I suggest to you that you don't do it. I mean, if you're going to complain about it, I mean, talking about the Lord, right? You're doing it for the Lord, but you're going to complain about it. I suggest don't do it. Get your heart right, and then you can do it later when your heart's right. Amen? Labor of love. You know, if, it, you know, if, a, if a young man, for example, loves a, 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 a woman, he's going to, oh, sure, I would love to do that for you. It's a labor of love. I would love to do that for you. You know, that's the same idea. God, you love me so much. I want to give you my love. I want to do this for you. I would love to do that for you. Reminds me of when we were uh, our, sending our kids to the orphanage in Mexico. And um, many of you, I think, know that we support this orphanage of disabled children. And it's a tragic, tragic thing because these, these kids, these orphans, would not have... Uh, love. They would not have a family. Um, they're kind of what society might call throwaway children in that society. And so this is the only home they'll have. These orphans stay there all their lives. They will live out their lives there. They will die there and when they grow up. And uh, so we would send our youth group down there. And of course, it is a labor of love. And you're taking care of these orphans we would take over the orphanage and allow the entire staff to take a vacation. And we are serving all of these orphans. And that means cleaning their diapers, um, feeding them, taking care of them, getting up at night with them. And uh, one year in particular, the leaders started noticing that the kids were kind of grumbling, taking on an attitude. And they, they were resisting asked to do this, and they started resisting. Asked to do that, they started resisting. So they, they drew all of the kids together from our church and sat down with them and explained to them the heart that God wants us. A labor of love is seen when you love to do it, when you want to serve. You delight to do it. So then they said, um, kids, how about this? When you're asked to do something, you say, I would love to. And uh, that would, you know, really help, I think, reflect your heart if you would say those things and actually really do it. And so the kid's like, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. And so the rest of the time, they started using that phrase, I would love to. And when they came home, we, we delighted to receive those kids home because they came back with a completely different attitude. And it was refreshing. Uh, and some of my kids were on that trip. It's like, yes. It was beautiful to have them say, I would love to. If only they would have just stuck with that the rest of their lives. <laughs> I would love to. See, you can always tell a real servant. See, you can always tell a real servant. 
A real servant loves to serve. I love to. I would love to. There's a delight in it. You know, you're not doing it for uh, someone's kudos. You're not doing it to be noticed. You're not doing it, you know, to kind of puff yourself up. And did you see? I was serving there. But you're doing it as a labor of love for the Lord. And so there's an attitude of, I, I would love to. I'd love to. And there's a delight in it. And so he, Paul just takes note of it. And what maturity already, labor of love. And then he says, and a steadfastness of hope. I think the King James says patience of hope. Same idea. There's a steadfastness, not up and down, wishy-washy, one day up, one day down, faith. But there's a steadfastness of hope. It's a beautiful picture, I think, of maturity, of maturity of faith. Steadfast, consistent. Just steady as she goes, you might say. That's especially seen in difficulty. When the wind blows hard, the storms come against it, and yet it's steadfast. That is a steadfastness of hope that he wants for all of us. That's maturity. We should all desire it. God, I want a steadfastness. Now remember what kind of hope we're talking about here. This is not the kind of hope. Uh, we use a word in English um, that says, I don't know. I hope, but I don't know. In other words, I hope that, you know, it's nice weather this weekend. I mean, I don't know. I hope so. I hope uh, the, you know, Warriors win the championship. You know, I know that's touching on sensitive stuff, but, you know, I don't know, you know, but I hope. I don't know, but, you know, I hope. That's kind of the idea. Um, but, this word in the Greek is not that. It's not the, I don't know, but I'm hoping. It's, I know in whom I have believed, and therefore I have hope. I hold on. It is an anchor to my soul. It is a rock on which I stand, and therefore I have hope. I look forward because I have entrusted these things unto the Lord, and therefore I have hope. See, to me, it's a whole different thing. So he commends them for their steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the presence of God our Father. Knowing brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you, choosing of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but our gospel came to you in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Now, there's Paul speaking about how he came with the gospel and how he presented that gospel with full conviction of his heart. Wouldn't you have loved to have heard Paul give the gospel message? I mean, I think when Paul gave that gospel message, there was something very compelling about it. You know what's interesting? If you look at the book of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians as well, you'll pick up that Paul did not have a reputation for being an eloquent speaker. He, he did not. Uh, Apollos, now he had an eloquence. And when, when, when Apollos spoke, there was, there was something very you know, moving about his speech because he was an eloquent speaker. And some people used to compare the two and, and uh, you know, Paul didn't come out favorably in that. See, well, if he wasn't very eloquent in speech, well, how in the world, how, how did it happen that revival seemed to break out in every city he was at? How did that work exactly? How did that happen? You would think that, you know, eloquence of speech would be a requirement. Answer, full conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's what it was. He had, he, what a conviction. I mean, the, the, the gospel was just written on his heart. Full conviction. And when he spoke, I think there was just something of the Holy Spirit that was just moving in power. You know, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. Right, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. And so therefore, when the gospel goes forth, it goes forth with power. And lives are changed. It goes forth because it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. And this is why revival happens. This is why people open their heart to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because the Holy Spirit sends forth the gospel with power. And revival happens. The word of God, the scripture says, is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's living, it's active. Uh, Isaiah 55, the word of God that I send forth, 
that I send forth will not return void without, re without accomplishing the purpose for which I sent it. And there's this powerful understanding that God's word is sent with power and that it is alive, it's living and active, that the gospel goes with power. And so Paul speaks it with full conviction and revival breaks out. So he says, I remind you of this. The gospel didn't come to you just like in word only, but it came in power and the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. We lived it. We proved it. We lived it. Interesting, verse 6. You also then became imitators of us. We read it. Ever, you know, had um, uh, something come against you? Okay, something come against you. And yet, at the same time, there's something that arises up inside of you. Like, you know what? The enemy can throw things against me, but I'm going to stand in the name of the Lord. There's just something that arises. Even in the midst of conflict, even in the midst of that coming against you, there's something that just arises in you. It's like, yeah, things can come against me, but I'm taking my stand in the name of the Lord. And there's something, when you do that, there's like this, there's this joy. There's like this exhilarating, I, the, the move of the God of the Lord is powerful, and it is awesome. I remember we were doing a pastor's conference in Africa, and uh, one difficulty after the other, and it just seems like, everything was an obstacle, but man, was God ever moving in power. And I remember I would, you know, lay down to go to bed and just be excited. I didn't want to go to sleep. I felt like I was, you know, on some, floating on some amazing river that was just, uh, you probably think I'm weird. It's like this flowing of work of God was just so amazing. I didn't want to go to sleep. And it was just an exciting thing. In spite of all the troubles and difficulties and turbulence and everything against us, it's like exciting. Have you ever experienced like in the midst of, you know, if you're in football, maybe you, you're late. It's like, hey, challenges hitting all the times. This is really fun. Okay, yeah. All right, moving on. <laughs> but he says, notice this in verse 6. You became imitators of us. Okay, so Paul says, I came with full conviction, with the power of the Spirit. You saw the, you know, the, the, what, what we proved to be among you. You became imitators of us. I love that picture. I remember you know, growing up, the different pastors that I had. And I remember, um, I want to be like that. It's like, I want to, and I think that's why I'm a pastor today. Because a, a pastor just so strongly influenced me. I, I just saw what God was doing and how God was using him. And there was something in me that said, I want to do that. I want to be like that. And have you ever seen someone with faith? Have you ever seen someone with authentic, genuine faith? And you look at their life and you say, I want to be like that. Have you anybody, just a show of hands. Anybody ever seen someone? I want to be like that. Here's my challenge. Here's, I think, the Holy Spirit's challenge to all of us tonight here. Can we all be someone like that? Can we be someone like that so that a young person can look up to you and say, I see your life. I see your life. I see something authentic, real. I, want, I don't know what it is, but I want to be like you. I want to be like you. I want to have faith like yours. I want to, I want to be alive like you. I want, to, I, want to, I want to live like you. Wouldn't it be awesome if someone looked at your life and said that? I want to be like you. When I grow up, I want to be like you. When my faith grows up, I want to be like you. When, 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 I, when I get more mature, I want to be like you. Wouldn't that just be awesome? How many people would say, I want to be a person like that? It's a powerful, powerful thought. And so he goes on, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in tribulation, but with the joy of the Spirit. So that you became an example 
See, there it is. So that you became an example to all the believers in the whole area of Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. I think the King James says, uh, like, trumpeted forth. I love that. The word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. In other words, they look at your life and it's like it's, it's singing a song. It's like it's sounding out. We can see the reality. It's singing for us. The word of the Lord has sounded forth for, from you, not only in the areas of Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth. You're, you're becoming well known so that we have no need to say anything. Your reputation is, is well known to the other churches and the other places and around. For they themselves, verse 9, report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. The transformation in your life, we could see, people could see it. You turned away from idols. You turned from those things to God. To serve a living and true God. Do we have idols today? Now, we know that they had idols back then, and they were um, idols that were associated with particular temples and particular gods of particular things, and it was a whole system of idols. And many of them kind of represented worldly, fleshly, sinful things, as you can imagine. Do we have idols today? We do. They just take different forms. And so an idol is anything that, that takes the place of God in your life or distracts from God in your life. And there's a number of things that could be idols, anything you idolize, any person that you idolize, anything that you put as a higher priority in your life than God. And it's, it's got first place. It's got a higher place than God. And so he says, you turn from that, you turn from those things in order to serve a living and true God. See, now I love that phrase. Here's why. Because if your faith is real, if there's a real faith, authentic, real faith, then you, are, you have that faith because you believe in a living and true God. You are believing in God. And that is alive in you. That because you believe in a living and true God, your heart is stirred up. Because of that, you're, you, you're transformed in your heart. And he says that is the result of something real. And then it says this, your reputation has been well known. How you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, he's alluding here to something he's going to explain in great detail in chapters 4 and 5, which is the prophetic word of the return of Jesus Christ. And here's why this was relevant. Because there was such an anticipation. Paul spoke of the return of Christ. Of course, Christ spoke of this to Paul. And so, therefore, Paul would stir people up as he would go and share the gospel. He would share the gospel of salvation, but then he would encourage people by saying, now you wait, be on the alert, for the return of the Lord indeed is a sure promise of God. You watch, you wait, you be on the alert. Now, Jesus said something similar. If you remember back in Matthew 24 and 25, he said, similarly, the Son of Man will return at a day and hour that you do not expect. Therefore, you stand on the alert. You be ready. You have your life spiritually on the alert. When you see these signs, then you will know that the end is near. Watch for these signs. And he began to explain he said, you know, when you see the buds forming on the tree, you know that summer is near. Those buds on the tree are indicators of what is to come. Summer is near. And then in another place, he said, you are able to read the signs of the sky. In other words, you know, we have a saying, you know, red at night, sailors delight. You know, red in the morning, sailors take warning. So 
You can read the weather. You can look at the sky. You can discern that. But can you discern the signs of the times? And so he began to describe the condition of things in the world that will indicate that the end is near, that the Son of Man will return. Now, we will look at that as we start into this book because it has everything to do with prophecy. So when Paul goes around and he shares the gospel, he would share about the return of Christ because Jesus did. But notice what he says. The fact that you wait, in other words, you wait with um, anticipation and being on the alert. Maybe an illustration might be um, like, how do you wait? Um, if the Lord, you know, is, is not uh, come back, well, how do you wait? I think some people would take on the attitude of, well, I'll just wait. And I'll just, you know, do other things that I like to do and kind of just live my life and just kind of go about my business. And, you know, I'll, hopefully I'll know it. Other people, I think, take an attitude of alertness and they want to prepare. They want to get ready. And so maybe an example would be a woman who's pregnant. So a woman who's pregnant doesn't just wait. Any woman who's pregnant would tell you there's a sense of urgency about things. Um, men are having a hard time relating to this illustration. But women are going, yes, that's right. This is exactly right, Pastor. You know exactly right. See, I know about these things myself. Because I was a coach, and I was a really good coach to my wife when she was... Okay, moving on. So, but when you're pregnant, right, there's a, there's a sense of urgency, and you want to get things ready. You want to get the room ready. You want to get your, you know, you want to get the room painted. You want to get the, the bassinet thing, whatever you call that. And you want to get the diapers. You want to get the bottle. It's like you, you want to clean the house. You want, you want to do things to prepare and get ready. Anybody relate to this? Okay, the women, thank you. And so... There, that's the kind of waiting that God wants for us to have. Waiting with that anticipation and preparing your life. But notice what it says, verse 10, to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Here he is referring to what many of you probably know if you've studied prophecy at all, is the great tribulation. There is a period of time coming, and I believe very near, when the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the world. Now, what's interesting is this phrase, it says here, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And he's going to explain them when we get to chapters four and five in regards to the tribulation period, but... He's going to speak also about the rapture of the church. That the church is not destined for wrath. That's one of the phrases that we capture out of this first letter of Paul. Let no one deceive you. Let me explain this to you. He says, we, speaking of Christians, the church, are not destined for wrath. That is the wrath of God poured out on the world. And he will save, he will redeem, pull out, you might say, through the rapture of the church before the wrath of God is, is poured out. Maybe an illustration of that would be, if you remember when Abraham was visited by the Lord and after the, the, that visit, the conversation, they turned their, their eyes towards Sodom. The Lord then said, shall I withhold from Abraham what I'm going to do at Sodom since the world will be blessed through him. I will reveal it to Abraham. So he begins to speak of the great wrath of God that will be poured out on Sodom. Now remember what then Abraham said. Would you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? What if there are 50 righteous in that city? And he said, I would spare the city if there were 50 righteous. And then you know the story. Abraham presses it a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm humble and contrite. Bear with me. Can I ask, 
would you, would you destroy for five less? The Lord answered, I would spare if 45 righteous were found in the city. I'd spare the entire city. Bear with me while I, while I ask again. Would you destroy the city for 40? No. If there are 40 righteous, I'll spare the city. Let me ask again. Bear with me in patience. Would you spare the city for 30? If there are 30 righteous, I will spare the city. Bear with me while I ask. Would you, would you spare the city if there were 20 righteous? If there are 20 righteous, I will spare the city. He ventured one more time. What if there were only 10? What if there were only 10? I will spare the city if there are 10 righteous. Which is why, by the way, in Jewish tradition, there must be 10 Jewish men in order for there to be a synagogue. If there are 10 Jewish men in a city, they are obligated to start a synagogue, according to Jewish, using that particular conversation with Abraham and the Lord there. As we know the story, of course, the angel of the Lord went down, and the only one that was righteous was Lot. And so if you remember, though, before the city was destroyed, the Lord sent angels to actually take Lot and his family by hand and, and take them out of the city. That, in many ways, is a picture for us of the rapture of the church. It will be removed first before the wrath of God is poured out. Now, we're going to speak in more detail because this is a really key book. And so, uh, how does this unfold? What does it look like? What are the details of that rapture? I'm glad you asked. We will look at that as we go through. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. This book is such an important book for us. And I pray that we would open our heart to really grasp these things that are so critical to our understanding, especially in light of the days in which we now live. We are living in days where we look at those signs of the times and we begin to see now a sense of urgency in this. It's like a, a, a woman of pregnancy getting nearer the end of that term. A sense of urgency arises in us when we look around the world and we see the things that are happening in this world. And so church tonight as we're praying, the concern of course is for, for every soul that's in this room tonight. Every soul that's in this room tonight. God is concerned for every soul. And so tonight, I really want to encourage you. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you opened your heart to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Because that is the heart of God for you. That is his desire for you. And he speaks that gospel, that word of truth to you with full conviction. Because he's so concerned for your soul. He gives it to you with great conviction. And so tonight even, if you would open your heart and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want you to have the opportunity. I want you to know that that salvation is yours for the receiving. His heart is after you. He's knocking on the door of your heart. Would you even open your heart tonight and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Would you do that? Would you just raise your hand and say, yes, I would. I will open my heart to receive Jesus Christ. I want that hope of salvation. I want that eternal life that God promises me. I open my heart tonight to receive that. God bless each one of you. I see several hands opening your heart to receive Jesus Christ. And the assurance of that hope, I see several hands. Anyone else, I want you to know the hope of salvation is yours. Anyone else receive Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, forgiver of sins. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, O oh God, for the move of the Spirit. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the move of the Spirit upon us. We just receive you tonight. We want your Holy Spirit to move upon us tonight. Thank you for stirring us. Thank you for convincing us. Thank you for pouring out the word by the Spirit in full conviction. Thank you, oh God, for everyone here tonight. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, 
Amen. Can we give the Lord praise? And glory and honor. Amen. And here's what I'm going to do. We're